So, um, Andrew, you're in a sort of slightly different realm than our previous two speakers in that you are a uh, member of the, well, you're an executive director of the Manitoba Park Producers. So you, you have more of a sort of a role within which, within a sort of specific area. So we're going to give you some time to talk about pork and, and the uh, future of that as well in uh, Manitoba. Well, uh I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak tonight. When people introduce me to uh, sort of general public meetings like this. Um, sometimes I feel like Darth Vader just arrived at the uh, bad scene, you know, and uh, everybody's about to get zapped somehow. Um, I like to think Darth Vader is just a misunderstood individual, and uh, <laughs> perhaps followed the uh, a less than enlightened path in life. But, uh, I mean, I spent 30 years working in extension in agriculture. I mean, I uh, worked on farms in England, took a degree in agriculture and so on, and uh, my background is actually from an urban environment. Then lived for over 30 years in rural Manitoba, and I actually moved back into the city recently. And this going back between urban and rural is uh, very interesting. You know, you used to live out in the country, and you put your washing out in the line, you never worried about it. You can't do it in the city. You don't want people seeing your underwear drying out on a line. So we have dryers and all these sorts of things. And when you think about it, 40 years ago, people had washing lines. You didn't have dryers and so on. So life changes, people move on. Um, and agriculture's like that as well. People talk about, uh, you know, the movie Babe and, uh, you know, <laughs> Willie Nelson farming and something. Willie Nelson actually has his own brand of marijuana, apparently. So uh, anyway, I guess he's moving on. Um, <laughs> Uh, you got to make a buck somehow, you know, when your voice runs out. Um, so we're all driven by to me, we're driven by economics. I have an economics training. It's I mean, life is about incentives, and the big incentive in life is making a buck, getting ahead, and you need money to pay for things. And there's uh, John Kenneth Galbraith wrote an interesting book called Money and uh, what happens to it in history. And agriculture is much like that. Farmers make investments in land and equipment and buildings and their staff and apply it and they expect a return on their investment and if it's good, they'll invest more in that particular business and if not, they'll move on to something else. And they supply goods and services to a marketplace which is driven by consumer demand. So if consumers want pigs, farmers will produce pigs. If consumers don't want pigs, they won't produce pigs, they'll produce something else, they'll be chickens or Karen's idea here of uh, artificial meat, you know what I mean? Apparently Whole Foods uh, was supplied uh, fake chicken for two weeks in its one of its salad uh, presentations in its stores, and nobody noticed. It was only the inventory control guy realized they had the wrong product code on it, and uh, they actually withdrew it, but there were actually no complaints from anybody. Which is, if I was the chicken business, I'd be a little scared right now. Well, apparently it was in the U.S., so. Whole Foods, they're not in Winnipeg yet, I don't think, so anyway. Of course, the other thing that tells you something about the discrimination of our consumers about their ability to test chicken, so uh, <laughs> anyways, first slide. Agriculture is a big business in this province. And I know you sit in the city here and you know you might go out to the cottage beyond the perimeter and so on, but to be honest with you, there's 20 million acres out there that's been run by farmers. They're the big landowners. They're the ones who have the most impact on the landscape of Manitoba, essentially southern Manitoba. We don't farm the top 87% of the province, but, uh, and most of it's within you know, a three-hour drive of the U.S. border. But sales, and this is last year, were about $5.6 billion. Crops, about, and split half and half between crops and livestock. To put that in some sort of perspective, everybody goes on about hydro is a big business and so on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their total sales were $2.3 billion, they exported $400 million worth of stuff. Agriculture, the vast bulk of its stuff is exported out. It's huge to this province. This is where we make our money. 25% of our manufacturing business is in food and food processing. Huge. Now it's different from Ontario, it's different from Quebec and so on, very different from BC and so on. But in Manitoba, farming is a key part of the, uh, our income, our, this is how we make our money. This is what pays for hospitals, it pays for our roads and so on. Um, and it's different. I mean, we have about something like 20,000 plus farmers in the province. 
But you know, 2,500 of them produce 75% of the production. Uh, these are big operations now. They got large acreages, large amount of capital applied, very sophisticated equipment, staff groups, managers, and so on. Things have changed. Just in our industry alone, in hogs, two companies are responsible for 40% of the hog sales in the province. Now, one of those companies has 600 staff. So, is that a bad thing, a good thing? I don't know. I mean, most people in Canada work for companies. They work for organizations. Uh, is that bad? Well, people say, oh, no, we don't, we don't like big corporate agriculture. Well, no one has any problems working for General Motors or Ford, or working for the government, or working for the university, or working for the Winnipeg Free Press. Right? <laughs> um, the other thing is, we're the big user of biotechnology. It's huge. We're the first user of anything. You got a new tractor, we'll use it. You got a new engine, we'll use it. You got a new product that kills weeds, we'll use it. Um, if you've got a good idea on how to apply money in some creative way, we will use it. We use everything that will make us efficient in the world. We compete in this province against the world. Fortunately, we're very good at it. For example, in my industry, the one I work for is in the hog industry, 40% of our farmers are cost competitive with our counterparts in Iowa. Iowa is huge. Iowa produces 50% more, more pigs than all of Canada put together. We are cost competitive with Iowa, which is the lowest cost producer in the planet. This is good for us. The other 30% is within $5 of being competitive with Iowa. So that's not bad. Our grain producers are some of the most productive people in the world. Our dairy farms are phenomenal. We adopt technology. We've got robot milkers now because we have labor issues. Our chicken barns are super efficient. Egg laying is super efficient. And the quality is way up, miles better than what it was 30 years ago. Anybody wants to go back and eat the standard of food they have in the 1940s, go ahead. I don't want to eat it. People say, oh, I like the Victorian rations and the Victorian food and all that stuff. They used to can their food with lead. Who wants lead in their ration anymore? In fact, apparently uh, one of those... Oh, ration for people. Sorry. <laughs> Diet. It's hanging around on farms too long. <laughs> Oops, I turned it off. We also have to deal with myths all the time. Somebody phoned me up today and talked to me about the hog industry, and they asked me about how many numbers are there. And I says, well, we produce about 8 million pigs. Well, there's only 1 million people in Manitoba. I mean, and they got somewhat concerned. And I'm, what does it matter? Like, so what? There's more chickens in the, and there are people in the province. There's more beef cows than there are people. Does that really matter? There's more beetles in the ground than there are people. There's more earthworms than there are people. Does it really <laughs> matter? The real issue here is the impact it has, to me, on terms of things like public policy. Because you get these mythologies going, oh, we've got to control the expanding hog industry. We've got to ex control expanding corporate farming. If we've got 2,500 farmers producing 75% of the production, that means we've got about 17,000 smaller farms. How many more small farms do you want in the province? We've got 17,000 of them, so we seem to be doing okay. So it's, we need to sort of start thinking out, is, where are we going with agriculture in the long run? And it's a big chunk is going to be driven by, as Karen pointed out, climate, technology, and so on, but also by the economics of it. We have to be competitive in the world in terms of selling product into world markets. We can't eat all the food we produce in this province. It's not enough. It doesn't work. And up here I've got a picture of a, and I wouldn't call this a standard barn, but it's one of the larger barns we have in the province. It's like a, like I, I don't mind the fact, it's like a small factory. It's a large building, it's enclosed, controlled environment. The manure is stored in those uh, outdoor lagoons that you see on the uh, right hand side of the picture. And people go to work there. It's, uh, they got health plans, pension plans, steady work. It's all year round. The animals are looked after in the most perfect environment in the world in terms of temperature control, humidity and so on. And they're fed perfect rations. And, they do, and we use the best in genetics, they do very well, 
and the manure is used to put on the land to feed the crops and feed the pigs. This is a form of sustainable agriculture at this moment in time. Will climate change change that? I don't know. Let's, what do we use in that barn? We use grains that we can't eat as human food. We use number three wheat. We use barley that's, that can't be used for malting purposes. We use corn, which some of which can be eaten by people, but most of it's grown for animal feed. It's a very efficient plant in terms of converting sunlight into starch and protein. And I that's uh, actually a field of corn there on the right, if I'm correct. Everything's large scale. And these are estimates on the number of barns in the province. We have about 500 sow barns, 170 nursery barns. This is where we take the little pigs, bring them up to about 60, 40, 50 pounds, and then we put them in the finisher barns where they grow up to about 260 pounds, and we have about 375 of those. But in terms of capital investment, if we had to redo it tomorrow, it would cost us about $1.7 billion investment. That's what farmers have put into their buildings alone. In operating costs, it's about a billion dollars a year. In terms of feed and labor and so on. This is big business, and this is how it works nowadays. I, I mean, these mom and pop shows that you see on TV they, is a fiction. We've moved on beyond that. And this is just pigs. This is the impact we have on the labor force. We create, both on the farm and processing jobs, and there's a big plant here in Winnipeg, there's a big plant in Brandon, there's a plant in Ebola and so on. About 12,000 jobs in the province. In terms of exports, in terms of pork products, live pigs going out in the domestic market, we're probably sales about one and a half billion dollars. It's a big business. There's two, and this is the processing plants and so on. Just as, I mean, people don't have been to Brandon very often, but a plant in Brandon, it's run by Maple Leaf, it's a food company based in Toronto. That plant in Brandon is the single largest manufacturing plant in the province by the number of workers under one roof. One of the issues we faced in the last number of years is this issue of public policy and what the provincial government has done to the industry. One of the key problems we've got is being this misperception of the impact of an industry. And I showed you the graph, it showed it's been pretty steady growth over the last 10, 15 years. It was this idea that the industry was out of control, there's been this sort of 45 degree growth in the industry and it's polluting Lake Winnipeg because of all the manure. Government press releases, one after the other, about halfway down, but always said, we're doing something to save Lake Winnipeg, we've got a moratorium on the hog industry. And I had a graph here, but it just didn't come up. But it's a mythology. The pork industry is not the cause of the pollutions of Lake Winnipeg. There's all kinds of reasons why Lake Winnipeg's got a problem. We're a very small part of it because we put our manure in the land. From the land, you get phosphorus running off in springtime into our rivers, into our water courses, and eventually into Lake Winnipeg, which is essentially a repository of water for all of Western Canada. Phosphorus and fresh water, you don't need very much of it to cause an algal problem. And we are maybe 2%, 3% in terms of impact on the landscape, in terms of what we've used them in Europe for. When you add it all up, we're a tiny, tiny percentage of the issue of Lake Winnipeg. But we got singled out because for public reasons they needed a whipping boy, and we got blamed for it, amongst other people. Of course, we don't talk about the time the city of Winnipeg discharges sewage into the Red River 18 times a year. So all those people fishing at Lockport might want to little think about that. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying too much there because I used to live near Lockport. <laughs> but do people know that the beef industry accounts for like four times the volume of phosphorus going on the landscape? Because they're bigger, there's more of them. We import 
about 140,000 metric tons of phosphorus into the province. Our industry contributes about 5,000 tons to the landscape. And that phosphorus originally came from the soil and it came from the crops which we fed to our animals. Finally, the government's realized there's an issue that needs to be addressed because we were stopping building. We weren't going to build any more barns because of the moratorium thing. They backed off now and we're finally going to be able to use an alternative technology called the multiple cell lagoon system. In the next 10 years, we need to rebuild that $1.6 billion worth of barns because they're about 20 years old and we need to build more capacity to fill up our processing plants because they're not operating efficiently. But this is the impact we can have on our economy. Bad public policy stopped billions of dollars in investment. And it's going to take us years now to restore confidence amongst farmers to invest in this industry. Pigs historically have been, they were called the mortgage burner on farms. How do we get back to that? And this is where we have to be careful. Karen talks about technology, climate change, and so on. I'm not sure that the public policy process that we have at a provincial government level has the capacity to be able to handle that. And that's a bigger issue. It's not just an agriculture, it affects health, it affects our infrastructure, it affects how we're gonna handle the aging issue and the prop and the, amongst our population. What are we gonna do to handle one million people living in Winnipeg? How are we going to deal with new immigrants coming in? How are we going to deal with our native issues and so on? These are, can our structure that was invented by the Victorians in terms of how to delegate authority on various issues through the BNA Act, essentially, is that appropriate for a world that's competitive against each other? So I leave that, and, I'm, and I'd like to get into a debate on that. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. I appreciate that.